again, we welcome you to our Secrets Unsealed Summit. And if you've been with us over the last several days, you have heard many anointed presentations on the Word of God under the title, the theme, the subject of Rightly Dividing the Word. We have tried, by the grace of God, to give you the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, as together we search the Word of God for truth, which is housed in this Word of God. This is my fourth presentation in this ongoing discussion of how conversion works. We are calling it the conversion continuum. We've talked about conviction. We've talked about uh, repentance and what that means and how the two flow together. Moving into conversion and then uh, into the sanctification experience. And so all of these ideas are intimately related and we've tried to look at and examine and sort of demythologize each of them and show how they work in the life of the Christian. They happen very quickly, they happen almost simultaneously, but there is a parsing of this experience, which is why we call it a continuum, and one in order to be fit for heaven must wend his way, her way through each of these progressive steps. We must be convicted, we certainly must repent, which includes ceasing the activity. You must love the Lord and hate the sin enough to quit. Moving into the conversion experience, which we're going to talk a little bit more about today. And then we sort of morph into sanctification. So they are all very, very, very much uh, related to each other and are part of the Christian's life experience. We have been using Acts chapter 3. And verse 19, as our primary text, as our source text, uh, as our foundation text for these four presentations. So we return to Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 again today as the foundation for what we want to talk about as we move through conversion and into sanctification, the process that fits us for dwelling with the Lord throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. I would ask you again to bow your heads with me as we speak to our Lord in prayer. Father God, again we praise you and thank you for this blessed opportunity that is ours to open your word. We thank you for this summit and for the mighty messages that have been preached in an attempt to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. We are convicted and convinced that that day, the day when Christ comes, is not far at hand. Indeed, we feel that it is even <clears throat> at the door. So we ask you again, Lord, to bless this presentation as we ask your blessing on each and every presentation that Christ may be seen, Christ may be felt, Christ may be glorified, and that our lives may be hid in Christ Jesus. Speak now to our thirsty souls. Give us water to drink so that we will thirst no more and that we'll, we will be prepared for eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Acts three nineteen. Repent therefore <clears throat> and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of God. The Lord. Repent and be converted, says the Word of God, the New King James Version. I want to go back just a little bit and recap and pick up a couple of things that we had talked about over the last uh, few meetings together as we reaffirmed the idea that it all starts with conviction, it all starts with this understanding that things are wrong and must be made right. That moves us into repentance, which is sorrow for sin, being sorry enough to quit, moving us into conversion. And we talked about true conversion as opposed to what might be termed a false or worldly sort of conversion, false or worldly sort of repentance, and we were examining what it means to give your heart to the Lord, looking at when last we met um, the lives of Peter and Judas 
and how their experience was cr with Christ was very different when you looked at how they responded to Christ, although Christ's response to each of them was pretty much the same. It was very, very similar. He showed love. He showed condemna uh, no condemnation. He showed compassion, is the word I want. And he showed them love in the face of their treachery. Now, we, we, we say treachery. It is acknowledged that Judas betrayed the Lord. But I rather think that a denial of the Lord is treachery also. Treachery perhaps of a different kind. But Peter's sin was no less grievous than Judas. The difference was how they responded to the overtures of love, even in the midst of their sin, from our Lord Jesus Christ. And that made all the difference. One of the other things that I want to reaffirm and that I want you to understand is the idea, the fact, the notion that indecision, being unbalanced in your walk with the Lord, leaving room for Satan to insinuate himself into your life, Ellen White tells us that actually encourages Satan to attack us and to press down on us. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, but a double-minded man, double-minded woman, a person who is not sold out to Jesus, who is not putting Christ first, actually, says Ellen White, encourages the attacks of the enemy. And so as you look at your own life, at your own Christian walk, or the lives and walks of those who you know and love, and it seems as though some people are constantly under the gun, perhaps one of the reasons why they have become a play toy of the enemy is because they have not settled in their mind that God will be first and best in their lives. And so Satan is aware of your indecision. Satan is aware of your lack of firmness in, in your walk with the Lord. And so he is encouraged to attack you because of your indecision. So your lack of firmness in your own Christian walk actually gives Satan encouragement to insinuate himself into your life in ways that he possibly would not if you were more resolute and more firm in your rebuffing of the world and your rebuffing of those things that Satan can sometimes do in our lives. When, when you say no as a Christian, you got to mean no. When you repent of your sins, you've got to repent fully. We talked about the last time uh, this fellow who died outside of the Ark of Safety. He died unsaved. Ellen White says he went in the woods, he would go in the woods and pray, and he'd go in the woods and pray and, and fast and, and skip meals, and then he'd come out, and then he would fall back into the same habits again and again and again and again, and it was this pattern of coming to the Lord and then going back to the world and coming to the Lord and then going back and resuming these habits. And uh, she says that God was not hearing his prayers because he was asking God to do for him that which he had the ability to do for himself. He had to put his will, and there's a wonderful study on the will. And if you want to do a wonderful study, look up all of those references in the spirit of prophecy that have to do with the will of man. How when we put our will on the side of the will of God, our will becomes omnipotent. In other words, we get the power we need to sustain ourselves under the assault of the enemy by a correct use of the will and surrendering your will to Jesus Christ. And then Christ works in you. He works with you. He works through you to strengthen that will so that you can say no to the devil and mean it. And of course, when, when you say no to the devil, God knows if you really mean it. 
And so does the enemy. The devil knows also if you really mean it. And if you don't mean it, you encourage him to keep coming back, to keep trying new tricks, to keep trying other ways to insinuate himself into your life. So you have to say no and mean it. When you repent of your sins, you must mean it. It must be godly repentance. It must be godly sorrow. And that will keep you and will keep the devil off your track and already off your doorstep. Uh, this is very, very important. Indecision invites satanic attacks. So you must be firm in your decisions to follow the Lord. <clears throat> Christ says, or rather Ellen White says, that Christ never needlessly wounded <clears throat> anyone. And so when we express to you the burdens of true Christianity, heartfelt Christianity, it's not in an attempt to depress you or discourage you. And we talked about that on our last sitting together. You're going to find things in your life that are going to disappoint you. But she says, don't be de depressed, don't be discouraged, and don't be surprised. Uh, we don't know ourselves as, as well as we think we know ourselves. So sometimes in our attempt to walk back to the Lord, we actually surprise ourselves. We didn't know that we could do some of these things or say some of these things or think some of these things. Well, the mind is desperately wicked. And the Bible says, who can know it? And many times we don't even know ourselves, which is why we must trust the Lord. I love this text that I'm going to read now. It's in Isaiah chapter 42, and I will turn to it. Isaiah 42. And we want to consider verses 2 and 3, and I'm reading from the New King James. I'm in Isaiah 42, and we're reading verses 2 and 3. Isaiah 42. And I'm in Isaiah 43, and here's Isaiah 42, 2 and 3. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed will he not break, and smoking flax will he not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful text. Now I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. A bruised reed he will not break off, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will not harm those who are weak and suffering. He will not harm those who are weak and suffering. That says that when you come to the Lord, Christ will receive you with open arms if your surrender to him is sincere. You're bruised, you're broken, you're saddened. You bring your bruised, broken, saddened heart to Christ and Christ will not bruise you any further. If your candle, as it were, is burning low, Christ will not be the one to extinguish your hope by giving you a mouthful of I told you so's and giving you a, a lecture on how bad you are, he's not going to be the one to extinguish your hope in him. It will be, Christ will be the one who not only fans that frame, but gives you hope to keep on serving him. He is faithful and he will bring justice. One of the things that we are and can be proud of and happy of and rejoice in is the fact that Christ has never and will never turn away a sincere soul, a sincere saint. So it doesn't really matter ultimately how long you've been in sin, how you've been walking in sin. When you come to Christ in true godly sorrow and repentance, Christ will receive you. You have that guarantee from the word of God. So let's go back to uh, the story as we were finishing up the other day uh, in our previous, previous message. We were comparing and contrasting Judas' life with Peter's life. Judas was unconverted. 
Peter too was unconverted. We know that by Christ's words to him, when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. So we've got two gentlemen, two men who had walked with Christ, one of them since the very beginning, both at the end of Christ's life are unconverted. Judas now rushes from the hall. You remember the, the, the story. He rushes from the hall. Judas says, it's too late. It's too late. We get this from Desire of Ages in the chapter entitled Judas. Ellen White says, he, Judas, felt that he could not live to see Jesus crucified. So in despair, he went out and hanged himself. In despair, he went out and he hanged himself. It was a cowardly act. When he came to himself, he could not face himself, so he hanged himself. You hear what I said? It was, a, it was the act of a coward. He had put a set of circumstances in motion, and when they played out as they could only play out, I mean, you set these things in motion. You have this idea it's going to turn out one way. It doesn't turn out that way. It turns out another way. So when he came to himself, when he realized what he had done, he went to Caiaphas. Eloi says Caiaphas brushed him off. He went to Jesus. And Jesus said, I, I came for this reason, for this reason came I into the world. So when he came to himself, he could not face himself. He could not face what he had done. And so he hung himself. It wasn't sorrow. It was more self-pity. Now let's examine this scenario just a little bit. Judas said, it's too late. It's too late. We get this from Desire of Ages. He rushes from the hall. This is a very telling set of words. The only person who has the right to determine when it is too late is that individual who is in charge of time. I want you to listen to me. You can't tell me when it's too late for me. I cannot tell you when it's too late for you. I can't even say when it is too late for me because I see through a glass darkly. I don't have the whole picture. I don't know the truth. Only God knows the truth. Until we close our eyes in death or until Christ comes, it is my belief that it is never too late. And certainly, we cannot make that call. There are many sins that can be committed. But you don't get to close the door on me and I don't get to close the door on you. The only person who can shut that door and say it is indeed too late is Christ himself. Christ makes that determination. And so since we have no biblical evidence of Christ making that statement, we must assume that it was not too late. Only Judas thought so. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. Revelation 20 and verse 11. And we'll just look at a couple of things and I'll show you one or two things before we move into sanctification. I'm in Revelation 22. Bible says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. At that point, it becomes too late. That is the time when the door of salvation is closed and the fates of all human beings are sealed. But that is a pronouncement that comes from heaven, not from you or me or even Judas 
after betraying his Lord. Judas committed the ultimate affront to grace, not only by betraying him, and I would say not so much by betraying him, but by giving up on Jesus. And this is the point that I want you to sort of bite down on, to lock down on. You can't give up on Jesus because Jesus never gives up on you. You can do things, you can say things, you can be a part of things that put distance between you and your God. But my Bible says to me, he that cometh unto Christ, he Christ will in no wise cast them out. The only thing that would separate you or keep your prayers from being heard is your own insincerity. You know, you can't play with God. God is not mocked. But if you come to him with a broken heart and a broken spirit, we've seen it so many times in the Bible, even individuals who have murdered under other individuals, and I've said this before, uh, you want to do some work and do a little detective work, just go through the Bible. You will find that just shy of 40% of the Bible is written by individuals who had murdered somebody else. So obviously, killing someone, though bad, though horrible, is not the unpardonable sin. And God can still use you as a murderer. I've baptized people in prison who have murdered other individuals, who have led other individuals to the foot of the cross and to Jesus Christ. And so when you come to him with a sincere heart, with a broken spirit, the Bible guarantees that Christ will accept you as a child and make you brand new in Christ Jesus. So it wasn't so much the fact that Judas betrayed him. It was that Judas gave up on him. Judas felt he believed the devil's lie. You've gone too far. You've done too much. He's going to be crucified. It's all your fault. So he goes out in a fit of self-pity and hangs himself. Here's the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Peter could have been saved and indeed was saved. Judas could have been saved and indeed was not saved. Why? Because Peter never gave up on Jesus. Judas gave up on Jesus and himself. So he hangs himself, the ultimate affront, giving up on Jesus. The, 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 it's not so much the, the suicide. It's the fact that the suicide is a statement, Lord, you're not powerful enough to resurrect me spiritually. I've done something that's even beyond your ability to forgive. No, no. There's nothing that you can do, no act that you can commit that Christ cannot forgive. The only sins that Christ cannot forgive are those sins that you do not confess. Because we said it before, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. But you must confess. Had Judas confessed his sin and thrown himself at the foot of Jesus in sincere, complete repentance, Judas could have been saved, I am convicted and convinced. He loved his money more than he loved his Lord. He left the door slightly ajar. Ellen White says, you invite and encourage attacks of the enemy. I say again, I've got to hear my notes three times when you don't make a decided effort to give your life to Christ. And so Judas let the, the love of money Keep the door ajar just enough for Satan to sneak in and insinuate himself. And it was the love of money and the love of pride and the love of his own opinion and a love of his own self-worth that allowed Satan to come in and control his life. So ultimately, when his plans did not go as he wanted them to go, his sadness, his chagrin, his shame, instead of coming to Christ in true sincerity and repentance, he took his life. He let go of Jesus when Jesus never wanted to let go of him. 
Christ is faithful. Let's go to this text, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. This is uh, a warning given by Paul to, Tim to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. We'll just touch on it and then um, we'll move on. I'm in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. We have used this before. It is a wonderful text. Uh, in fact, let's, let's go back to 12. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. That's a powerful text. If you just hold on, if you endure, you shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. That's, and that's turning away from him. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now, that doesn't mean if you walk away from the faith in Jesus. It means if for some reason, under test when your faith fails, just because your faith fails, it doesn't mean that God is going to return faithlessness with faithlessness. Even when your faith fails, God is faithful to you. It's a great promise because there are times in all of our lives when things happen and our, our faith fails. But it doesn't mean that God lets go of your hand, that God turns his back on you, that God turns away from you. When your faith fails, now this is not talking about living in sin and wallowing in sin and turning your back and walking away from Jesus. It's talking about those times when under test, under trial, under tribulation, your faith lapses. Doesn't mean that God's going to lapse with you. Um, I was telling someone the other day, they were saying that um, uh, they get upset and um, the other person stays very, very calm. And I was saying that's the way it should be. Somebody has to stay on shore and hold the rope. And that's what God does. You can dive in and, 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 and have a rough time, but God sort of stays on shore and holds the rope and is always there. So Judas was lost by a lack of faith. He had his faith in his self. He had his faith in his education. He had his faith in his mental ability. And when these things fell, his faith in himself and his allegiance to his money and his lack of understanding of the program of God conspired to have him turn away from Christ when he could have had the same redemptive experience that Peter had. He had it wrong, but so did all of the disciples. But he stopped at conviction. He knew it was wrong. He never really tried, ladies and gentlemen, to get it right. He died on the shores of conviction when the waters of repentance and conversion were open to him, open to him just as they were open to Peter. Peter drank. Judas drowned. So what is conversion? From a rational perspective. Well, if conviction, as we have said, is the sense that something is wrong and repentance is stopping to do, stopping the committing of that thing, that wrong thing, repentance is sorrow for that wrong thing, those wrong acts, and as we have labored the point, it is being sorry enough to quit. Then conversion is the act of making what is wrong right. I say again, conversion is the act or actions of taking that which is wrong and making it is right, making it right. So we begin with the sense Something is wrong. Repentance gives us sorrow for those wrong acts. We are sorry enough to quit. The next step is conversion. What is conversion? Conversion, ladies and gentlemen, is a U-turn. What did I say? Conversion is a or the U-turn. 
So what are the three words that define conversion for us? If someone ever asks you, what does it mean to be converted? Here is the biblical answer you give them in the fewest words, in the simplest of terms. We'll take out the A because A is an article. It is not really a word. Here are the three words. Conversion is a change of direction. Now, what did I say? Conversion is change of direction. Not to be confused with perfection. Not to be confused with sinlessness. Not to be confused with living beyond the lure of temptation. It simply means you have changed your direction. When you are converted, you have changed your direction. You have made a 180 degree shift in your life. Will you stumble? Probably. Will you make mistakes? More than likely. Will you still have less than brilliant decisions in your life? Probably so. Will you still disappoint your God and yourself? Sadly, probably so. But you have changed your direction. Now, let's do an object lesson. You're walking this way. You're walking and you're walking and you're walking. You're walking through life. You're born, you go to school, you're growing up, and you're walking. You're just walking through life. One day, you learn about Jesus. And one day, you meet Jesus. And you are convinced and convicted that Christ is going this way. He's going in the opposite way. So now, the more you learn about Christ, you realize you're never going to be saved. You're never going to be one with the Lord walking this way because Christ is going that way. So now, what do you have to do? You're walking this way. What must you do in light of the fact that Christ is going that way? Going in the opposite direction. What do you have to do if you're going to be walking with Christ? Now, here's what complicates matters so many times. If you look at the vast majority of people in the world, they're going the same way you were going before you met Jesus. So you've got a cloud of witnesses. You've got a host of people walking the same way wrong way. Some don't even believe in Christ. Some don't know Christ. Some have no connection with Christ. Some are antagonistic as it comes to the knowledge of Christ. Some believe in science more than they believe in Christ. And you're walking this way with this crowd of people. And it's hard sometimes to change your direction when you're in a crowd all going the same direction. Maybe you're in a church that is moving in this direction. Maybe you know people in your family, your friends, who are moving in this direction. And the longer you continue to go in this direction, the more comfortable you become traveling in this direction. But you are convicted and convinced that Christ is going that way. So now you've got a decision that you've got to make. You've got a task that you've got to exercise. You're convicted. You know this is the wrong direction. You are repentant. You're sorry for having spent so much time going in this direction. You need to quit. So what do you need to do? Well, the answer is simple. You need, first of all, to stop. Then you need to change your direction. It's just that simple. Conversion is a change of direction. 
You have determined you were once walking away from Jesus. Now you turn and you're walking with Jesus. And one of the great things about walking with Jesus is that if in case you should fall, Jesus is right by your side to pick you up. That's one of the benefits of walking with Jesus. He's right by your side to pick you up. It's like when Peter walked on the water, walking towards Jesus, and he began to sink, and he said, Lord, help me. And, and uh, Jesus reached out, picked him, lifted him up. That's the way it happens in your life. Once you're walking with Jesus, one of the added benefits is that when you fall, when you stumble, Christ is right there to pick you up. So we have made conversion so complicated, so complex. There are people who think you have to be sinless to be converted. There are people who think you have to be able, as the word is spiritually, walk on water when you're converted. No, you just change your direction. And you will be surprised how many wonderful things Christ can do with you and for you and through you and to you once you change your direction. Life gets sweeter. Your walk with the Lord gets more dear. You become a better person. All because you were once walking away from God. Now you're walking with God. Doesn't say that you're perfect. Doesn't say you'll never make a mistake. It does say once I was running from him. Now I am walking with him. I've changed my direction. Now let me give you a reading from Ellen White, this is from the book Evangelism. It's fairly lengthy, so I'll try to move through it uh, with as little commentary as possible. Um, it's from the book Evangelism, and it begins on page 286. The experience of genuine conversion. This is Ellen White in the book Evangelism. Thick little book, but a wonderful little book. I've, I've had the privilege of reading it any number of times when I used to do evangelism. We would do evangelistic meetings. I'd start an evangelistic meeting in New York City, ran a bunch of them that would start just after uh, the 4th of July and I'd run all the way through to Labor Day. So that's all of July, all of August, right into September, a long series of meetings. So we had many opportunities because every morning we went through the book of evangelism. The experience of genuine conversion, I have been shown that many have confused ideas in regard to conversion. They have often heard the words repeated from the pulpit, you must be born again. That's true. You must have a new heart. These expressions have perplexed them. They could not comprehend the plan of salvation. Well, sometimes that makes it a little complex. Many have stumbled to ruin because of the erroneous doctrines taught by some ministers concerning the change that takes place at conversion. Some have lived in sadness for years, waiting for some marked evidence that they were accepted by God. You're waiting for this euphoric feeling, and sometimes you never get it. They have separated themselves in a large measure from the world and find pleasure in associating with the people of God. Yet, they dare not profess Christ because they fear it would be presumption to say that they are children of God. Well, it is not presumption. If you're a child of God, you ought to say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, the Bible says. They are waiting for that peculiar change um, that they have been led to believe is connected with conversion. So they're waiting for bells and whistles and uh, a, a high kind of feeling. Not going to come. After a time, some of these do receive evidence of their acceptance with God and are then led to identify themselves identify themselves with his people. And they date their conversion from that time. That's from the time that they feel converted. But I have been shown, I have been shown that they were accepted into the family of God before that time. God accepted them when they became weary of sin and having lost their desire for worldly pleasures, resolved to seek God earnestly. So they were accepted, they were converted at the point of Conviction moving into repentance. Now, and that's why I said these things happen almost simultaneously and they happen very, very fast and they happen very, very rapidly because when you get tired of sin, when you get tired of the devil, when you get tired of playing games with your life 
and with the Lord, when you say, I'm stopping this, I'm changing my mind, that point is the point of your true conversion. That's the point where God accepts you. You may not feel like a victorious Christian, but the fact that you are tired of sin is an evidence of your conversion. So let me go on. I'm picking it up at... Um, God accepted them when they became weary of sin and having lost their desire for worldly pleasure, resolved to seek the Lord earnestly. That's the key. True hearted conversion, true hearted repentance. But failing to understand the simplicity of the plan of salvation, they lost many privileges and blessings which they might have claimed had they only believed when they first turned to God that he accepted them. So you don't need to go through any, my mother used to term rigmarole. You don't need to go through a lot of changes. You need not wait for a, a feeling. Trust God in the fact that when you come to him, you are converted. He will not cast you out. When you are sorry, when you're convicted, when you repent, then you are converted and then God accepts you. Even though you may not feel sometimes like a converted person, you are. Others fall into a more dangerous error. They are governed by impulse. Their sympathies are stirred and they regard this flight of feeling as an evidence that they are accepted by God and they are converted. So the other swinging the pendulum to the other side is the fact is that because you feel good today, because you're having a good day, because the hormones are all in sync and you're happy, that means you're converted. That is just as much a lie as, as the other feeling is. Conversion is not dependent. Your standing with God is not dependent on how you feel. Because some days you feel like a Christian. And the truth be told, there are some days when you don't feel like a Christian. Your Christianity has nothing to do or very little to do with how you feel. You've got to take the fact that God loves you, that Christ died for you, that he's pleading for you. And if you want to walk with him, if you've changed your direction, you are converted and your feelings have nothing to do with it. Um, the evidence of a genuine work of grace on the heart are to be found not in feeling, but in the life. By their fruits, Christ declared, ye shall know them. Powerful, powerful, powerful text uh, reading from Evangelism, page 286. So you've got to jettison your feelings. You've got to get rid of how you feel uh, because some days you feel good, some days you don't. On those days when you feel good, you're a Christian and sometimes when you, when you don't feel so good, you still are. I, I like to tell married people, if anybody's been married for a length of time and um, the truth be told is, some days you feel very married. It's just, you do. Husband acting right, wife acting right. You're walking down the street holding hands. Everything is just wonderful. And the truth be told, there are some days when you don't feel very married. There are some days when maybe there's a little strain or a little something going on. So yesterday we feel very, very married. Today, we don't feel so married. But here's the truth. On those days when you feel very married, guess what? You're married. Amen. On those days when you don't feel very married, guess what? You're still married. It hasn't changed. Your feelings have nothing to do with the status that you hold. It's the same way with conversion. Some days you feel very, very close to Christ. You get up and you just, birds are singing, sun is shining, everything is going well. There are other days when you get up, it's raining, it's thundering, it's pouring. You're not having a good day and your spirit is depressed. You are a Christian. You are converted on those days when you feel so close to Christ, you can reach out and touch him. You're still a Christian on those days when you don't feel like Christ is so close. He is still there. He's behind the clouds, but he has not left you. He has not forsaken you. So do not become a slave to your feelings because feelings are not conversion, good or bad. So the three words, conversion is a change of direction. It is change of direction. Jesus is going one way. You are going the other. You change and follow him. And Christ is right by your side. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 in the New King James. 
<coughs> excuse me, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Trying to go fast. We've got just a, a few minutes left. And I want to get some of these things in in another reading. The Bible says, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Powerful, powerful te text. You can be confident in the Lord. Because he is with you. You need not envy anybody's Christian experience or anything that anybody has because God is your helper. You know, I did some, some um, research just last evening. I, I tend to be a word person. Sometimes I'll get stuck on a particular word. And I got stuck on the word so. And um, I spent almost an hour and a half, maybe two hours, just dealing with the word so. Because the Bible says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So you can boldly say. Now that positioning of the word so just intrigued me. Because so is described as a highly poly, polysimous word. And I, I, I was not familiar with that word polysimous. Which simply means it has a lot of meanings and you can, you can use it in a lot of words. Polysimous or polysimous. Um, so is one of those kind of words. So can be a conjunction, an adjective, an adverb, a pronoun, a preposition, an adjective, a noun. It all depends on how it fits into the sentence. In this instance, it's used as what we call a coordinating conjunction. A coordinating conjunction is a word that connects two phrases on either side of it. So the word so brings together what's before and what's after in what we call a causal relationship. In other words, what comes after so is based upon what comes before so. So let's plug that back in to our text, Hebrews chapter 13, 5 and 6. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now we've got the coordinated conjunction that connects them both. So we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. So the so connects what's after with what is before. The fact that God will never leave us, he has promised that he will never leave us, and that he will never forsake us, gives me the right to say, the Lord is my helper. The fact that I can say that is based on the fact that he says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. The so is the coordinating conjunction that binds these two clauses together when God himself says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, then I can say by guarantee, the Lord is my helper. I, I love that, that juxtaposition, that, that blending together of these two thoughts. I can have confidence in God. I can have confidence in my conversion. I can have confidence in my redemption. I can have confidence in my sanctification because God has said he will never leave me nor forsake me. I am not claiming something that the Bible has not promised. This is neither hubris nor hyperbole. It's simply stating a fact. It is simply stating a truth that God has affirmed in the statement when the Bible says, for he, that is God himself, has said, he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So I can say, the Lord is my helper. And the Bible says, I can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. So when I am convicted, when I repent, when I have converted, I know that I've got help along this road to sanctification because God has said he's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. Now let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 31, very quick. Romans 8, 31, real fast, uh, because it just sort of puts a little pin in what we 
uh, are saying. Romans 8, and I'm at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Powerful. That's why I can say, that's why I can say God is my helper, because God has already said he's on my side. He's always going to stand with me. So I can know that Christ is with me in all of this because he's promised to do so. I can boldly say that I'm a converted person. So you don't need now, going back to our very first presentation, you don't need to fear raising your hand and saying you are a converted person because God has already said, I'm going to be with you. God has already said that if I'm for you, nobody can be against you. So you don't have to fear saying, I am a converted person and God is my helper. I'll give you a quick story. My wife is in Panama right now. She's been taking care of her mother for the past year. Her mother passed just uh, several weeks ago, a month and a half ago, just six weeks short of her 102nd birthday. On her 100th birthday, she, she actually danced with the president of the country uh, after turning 100. And uh, she did a pretty good job, bless her heart, at 100 years of age. At age 86, she was associate youth director of her local church. So she had a lot of energy, a lot of stamina. And my wife Irma has that same energy and stamina. She is a hard worker. Um, we, can, we can boldly say... We're working on, Irma's there working on, on our house. Uh, those of you who know me know the story. We had an earthquake several, a couple of years ago, and we got a setback, and we're working on the house and trying to clean up. You, If you get an earthquake in, in uh, your life, it, it's something you remember. First of all, you remember going through the earthquake, and I can remember that being knocked to the floor and shaking, shaking, shaking. But then financially, we ran into a lot of issues, and, and we can, and we were talking about this just last night, we can boldly say through all of this, God has been uh, our helper. Uh, with her mother needed 24-hour care for over a year, God helped with all of that. With this repair of the house, uh, God is helping with all of that. So we, we, we're thankful. We can boldly say God is a helper. It's not, it's not bragging. It's stating a fact. It's stating a promise of the Lord. Um, time is getting away from me, so let's go to this. Let's go to, let's go to My Life Today, page 250. And we'll try to bring this to a close before our time runs out. My Life Today, page 250, the words of Ellen White. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Through obedience comes sanctification. We're talking about moving from conversion to sanctification. Through obedience comes sanctification of body and spirit. This sanctification is the progressive work and 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 an advance from one stage of perfection to another. Now, we can take a lot of time with that. Stages of perfection. There is the ultimate perfection, but there are stages of perfection. Let a living faith run like threads of gold through the performance of even the smallest duties. So, sanctification, perfection, is in the ultimate doing faithfully of even the smallest duties. That all the daily work will promote Christian growth. We need to be faithful in everything we do for the Lord. Now, I go on. Thus, through the right use of our talents, we may link ourselves by a golden chain to the higher world. That's, that's a beautiful thought, that we have been linked and can be linked to heaven through faithfulness in doing what God asks us to do. Now, I don't have time much to explain uh, some of this, so I've got to just press on. This is true. This is true sanctification. For sanctification consists in the cheerful performance. Hear this now. Sanctification consists in the cheerful performance of daily duties in perfect obedience to the will of God. What is sanctification? It consists in the cheerful performance of daily duties in perfect obedience to the will of God. When it is in the heart to obey God, when efforts are put forth to this end, that is obeying God, Jesus accepts this disposition and effort as man's best service and makes up for the deficiency 
with his own divine merit. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Here's what she's saying. You give God your best. You give God your sincerity. You give God all that you have. And any shortfall, Christ will make up for with his own divine merit. That's what the justification process is. That's what the sanctification process is. It starts out with credit to your account of righteousness that you do not possess. And the more you spend time with Christ, doing the work of Christ faithfully, then Christ makes up the shortfall with his own divine merit. It's a really beautiful thought. The living Christian will advance daily in divine life. As he advances towards perfection, he experiences a conversion to God every day. Every day you get converted and reconverted. This conversion is not completed until it attains to perfection of Christian character. A full preparation for the finishing work of immortality. Now you may not know when you were first converted, but you ought to know when you were last converted because that conversion ought to take place every day that you open your eyes. You ought to reaffirm your conversion, your walk with Christ, and one day you will be a sanctified person. You will be, your justification will move you through the sanctification process, and the sanctification process is, of course, your fitness for dwelling with the Lord. Justification, your title. Sanctification, your fitness. Conversion, the means to that sanctification. And you ought to be sanctified. You ought to be reconverted. You ought to be resubmitted, recommitted to Jesus, to his will and his way each and every day of your life. That, ladies and gentlemen, leads to the true perfection of Christ's character in your life. God bless.